Let's pray together. Lord, that's what we're here to do, is to rejoice in your simple gospel, Lord. That's what we're here to do, to meet together, to meet with you, to say that we don't have it all together, we don't have it figured out, that a whole lot of times we do things our own way and we go astray, and we need help getting back to the center. We need help getting back to the truth of who we are called to be, the purpose in which you've called us to do and how to live. So we're here today, Jesus, to say that whatever you have for us, we're in. Whatever you want to speak to us, to do in us, we just tell you ahead of time, God, we're ready for that. We want that. We don't even know what all that looks like, but we just receive it by faith because you're here. And where you're here, there's life change. So we submit to that today. It is in your name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. You know, that really is what it's about. And I, and I love those songs. And it is true. We rejoice in the simple gospel. It truly is a simple gospel, but we are so good at making it difficult. We are so good at making a simple truth, although a life-changing, life-altering truth, more complicated than what it really is. It is about us being separated from God and us not having a way to God, and yet the Father loving us so much, He sent His Son Jesus into the world to die for the world that if we put our faith and trust in Him, we'll live forever in heaven with Him. But it's not just come to know Jesus and then I go to heaven. It is about the life he's created us for right here and right now. It is about the everyday moment walking in his purpose. And although the gospel is simple, it is complex. Because it invades our lives, it changes our lives, and it releases us into the world to be God's hands and feet. I've been reading a lot and studying a lot here lately about the history of the church and the historical evidence that we have for Jesus, his crucifixion, his resurrection. And it just energizes me. It does more than inspire me. It propels me on. I get really excited about that because the historical evidence we have for the resurrection of Jesus is overwhelming. Countless atheists across the ages have come to know Christ as they have sought out to look at the historical evidence of Jesus Christ. It's overwhelming. And yet we tend to make it so complex by something that we just sang about. It's not about religion. Religion can mess us up. But it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. I just got back from vacation. I had a great vacation, Charlie's own vacation. And as I said um, in the beginning, he's asked me to teach, and I always love the opportunity to teach. And it's interesting. I was looking back and praying over, you know, where we're going to go this morning. And I kept coming back to this passage of Scripture. I actually taught on this passage of Scripture here five years ago. It doesn't seem like five years ago, but it has been five years ago. And this scripture really got inside of me and began to, I'm going to use the word, arrest me about 11 years ago. And it still is changing and growing inside of me. And I'm still unpacking and seeing so many things in it today. And that is the beauty of the word of God, that it truly is God breathes. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. It is truly living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. In a, in a verse of scripture that we've read over and over and over and over and over and over and over again can still affect us every day and 
we learn new things about it through the Holy Spirit. That is the power of God's Word. It is eternal, it is unchanging, and it is true. And what we're going to be looking at today is an amazing story, one of my favorite stories in John chapter 5. And we're going to look at it here in just a minute. You know, what we're looking at today is all about God's grace. I don't know about you. I need grace. And God's grace and his economy, it is a crazy thing, right? Human grace says, um, you know what? I have compassion on you and I want to help you. Human grace says, you know, you look like you are in need and I think I can do something to help that. But grace in God's economy, Jesus says... To love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. Whoo! And in our flesh we respond, why in the world would I do that? You know what? I'm so glad that Jesus didn't ask that question because apart, here's the truth, apart from his saving grace, we are the enemies of God. And grace in God economy, as I said, says, love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. Romans 5, 8 says, but God, he demonstrated his own love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So into a hostile world, Jesus came. He came knowing that he would be crucified, but he still came. He came knowing that a thief on the cross was going to shout him down in the last moments of his breath, but he still came. He came knowing that people would come, draw near, hear him, say, thank you, I've heard it, you know, I've kind of experienced it, I see what you have to say, I appreciate you stepping down into humanity, giving your life for us that I may have life, but you know what, no thank you. He came knowing people would still walk away. And that's because his grace is absolute. It is complete. It is other. Grace in God's economy is truly radical. And it's not like we see grace and understand grace on a human level. It's been said that God's grace is the extraordinary love of God in motion in a way that you and I really grapple with and have a hard time understanding even to this day. And my prayer is that today that you will just understand God's grace in such a way that you'll just say, God, I'm all in. No matter what I've been through, no matter what my life looks now, no matter what is going on, God, I'm trusting you. I'm giving it all to you. You are not worthy of just my words, but you are worthy of my life. I am all in. And that is what true life worship looks like. And his grace and our worship are forever linked together. There will never be true, extravagant, whole life worship from a heart that hasn't seen, tasted, experienced, and, and understood and believed and received the complete and total revolutionary grace of God and the person of Jesus Christ. And just as we sang, it's simple. There's no rules. There's no regulations. It's a simple invitation to come. It's a simple invitation. Come with all your mess, with all your baggage, with all your questions. God's big enough for all of that, but just come. Come and meet the person of Jesus. So let's look at John together. Chapter 5. This healing at the pool of Bethesda. Verse 1 says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. So Jesus is on the way to this feast, this celebration. And the ver verse 2 tells us, Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Well, one thing that um, history tells us is the pool of Bethesda is this massive, like beautiful relic of the ancient world. And it was truly a sight to see. Uh, the pool had 
very several different components, if you will. It was surrounded by, or was in the day, it was covered by these portico, um, porticos and these colonnades on every side so that people could sit in the shade or they could be in this particular pool of Bethesda. And I want you to notice what happens. Verse 3 says, Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, if you have your Bible, or if not, you can check this out a little bit later. If you read on down and you look here in the footnotes, um, it will say in some very well, very good manuscripts include this part. From time to time, an angel of God would come to this pool of Bethesda, surrounded by all these lame and blind and paralyzed persons, and the angel would stir the waters. That's left out of some manuscripts, but again, it is in some manuscripts. And the thought being, because this was a mystical place, this was kind of a supernatural place, but for these people, it was their only hope. They placed this hope in this super, super superficial, mystical idea that if they were the first in the water, you didn't know what time it was, could be three, could be 12, could be two, who knows? But you just had to be there, and when that water was stirred, if you were the first to get in that water, you would be healed. So visualize the scene with me. I'm a visual person. I don't know about you. Visualize the scene with me. See if you can imagine the sight. There are five colonnades around this pool. It's jam-packed with people. Imagine people with all types of disabilities, all kinds of life-altering illnesses, and they're all waiting and watching the water. Maybe in the next few minutes the water would stir, and then they would get tired or maybe fall asleep, or they would hear the stirring, and people would start frantically doing whatever possible to get into the pool, to be the first in the pool. And as you can imagine, this is their only hope. This is not a place of manners. There was probably pushing and shoving, if possible, because some were lame. Maybe they were reaching their hands out and tripping. Who knows? But manners... Manners went out the door here. First in the water gets healed, or so they thought. In your mind, I can imagine it. Can you? The mad scramble, the dash, as these desperate people would try and probably do anything to be the first in the pool. People who are blind, they can't see the pool, but maybe they have family members or friends to point them towards the pool and help them walk into the pool. And we're talking about a person who maybe has the help of his or her family. And when the water would stir, the family member would push them into the pool. But only to find out someone made it first. And now you just got somebody that's wet. Somebody that's discouraged. And now you have a disabled person in the pool and you've got to get them out. This was not a place of celebration. This was not a place of joy. This was a place where there was a lot of misery and not a place where the normal person would be like, hey, I want to go hang out at this place. But this is the scene that Jesus walks into. And if we're really honest, behind closed doors when all the lights are off and nobody's watching, our lives look a lot like this as well. Because you and me have all been through things that have paralyzed us. And there's places in our life that are lame. There's places in our life that we've been blind. Maybe behind closed doors we're not locked into an addiction or anything like that. But maybe we are overwhelmed by financial need. Maybe we are overwhelmed by loneliness. Maybe we are overwhelmed by just anxiety. But here we have a situation that is not a place of celebration. And Jesus, on the way to a feast, diverts from the path. And he enters into this messy situation. And the same Jesus, the eternal God, that walked in that messy situation all those years ago 
He walks into our situation today. And he meets us right where we are. Look with me in verse 5. One who was there and been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned, and some translations say knew, the word learned and knew in, in the original text has the same type of meaning, that he had been in this condition for a long time. And we see Jesus asking this question, do you want to get well? Let's go back to that word do and learned. So that word in the original text in which the scripture was written, it implies a supernatural knowledge of this man's situation. It's like it's the same type of situation that if we were to go back and read in verse 1, Jesus, I mean in chapter 1, Jesus' encounter with Nathaniel, and then in chapter 3, Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. In both of those situations, we see that Jesus had supernatural knowledge of their situation, and he met them where they are. Same thing. Jesus walks through the crowd to the one. He had supernatural knowledge about this man who had been an invalid for 38 years. And here's a situation that's kind of hard to understand because Jesus asks him the question, do you want to get well? Well, let me ask you that question. Do you want to get well? We don't know why he asked him that question. Maybe it was just to help him understand the depth of his need. But I kind of figure out, I kind of, we can kind of draw the inclusion. He knows his need because he could probably be like, hello, Jesus. Yeah, you know, I do want to get well. I've been laying here for 38 years and, you know, waiting for the water to stir, and I just need someone to help me get in the water because here I am 38 years later, and I still haven't made it to the water. And Jesus is asking the question, do you want to get well? Verse 7, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Verse 8, then Jesus said to him, get up. Get up. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Can you picture that in your head with me? At the very word of Jesus, that man. (laughs) And this is what's beautiful. Let me hit pause right there. When we read this passage of Scripture, we don't get any indication that this person knew who Jesus was. This was was early on in Jesus' ministry. We don't have any indication that this guy even knew who Jesus was. Not only that, we have no indication... But this guy had faith. Isn't that a beautiful thing? (laughs) We don't have to jump through hoops to get to Jesus. We can't get there on our own. He comes to us. We don't see like that this man had faith nor knew him. But Jesus walked up to him and he simply said, hey, get up, take up your mat and walk. You know what happened? He got up, he took up his mat, tucked it under his arm, and he walked. You know what's also beautiful? In the original language, the phrase in which Jesus said, get up and walk, It carries the same idea that we read in Genesis where God begins to call out creation, call something out of nothing, let there be light. It's the same idea here. It's the same tense, the same feeling. Let there be light. I'm calling something out of nothing. Hey, man, get up, walk. Get up, get up. God's about creating new things in our life. 
outdated dreams, broken dreams, hopes, things that we thought, hey, I blew it, can't do it. I'm walking with a limp now. I, I, I don't know about you. I grew up in a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful church. But we all, at some point in time, have gotten some bad theology. At some point in time, and I, I, I've heard this at several different churches, even when I've traveled and done music, it's like, well, you sin and you do that. When you blow that, mm, you're kind of good done. You're going to kind of be put on the sideline. Or, oh, you struggle with that. You know, we don't need any anxious or depressed pastors or any anxious or depressed missionaries or any anxious or depressed followers of God. We've got to have a smile on our face the whole time. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You've heard it. But that's not the gospel. I want to tell you something this morning that you may not have heard growing up. It is okay for you to not be okay. Yeah. And for some of you this morning, I hope you take a deep breath and just exhale. Because Jesus is not asking you to get cleaned up. He's not asking you to get over that anxiety or depression. He's not asking you to get your finances in order. He's simply telling you to get up. Just get up. Come, come after me. Get up. Walk. And yet so many of us have heard a message that mm, if you do that, you can't be used by God. Mm, if you do that, you're going to walk around with a limp. Nah, God uses that as part of your story to lead others to Christ. God can use that thing in your life to help other people in the same way. It is okay for you to not be okay. It is okay for me to not be okay. But Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. He says, get up. Hey, man, get up. Hey, girl, get up. Take up your mat and walk because you're going to need it. You're going to need it. You're going to need to sleep on later. Not here. Not here. Not at this place. Not at this place you've been stuck in for 38 years hoping that some supernatural thing would happen, that the water is stirred, and you're going to be the first one in to get healed. Get up and just take a step. <laughs> just take a step. Just take a step. You don't have to take a leap. You don't have to know what's on the other side of that, but just take a step. Get up, take your mat, and walk. But you're not going to stay here. <laughs> you're going to need it in the next place. Jesus enters your story, and he enters my story. For our good and to rescue us, but for his glory. We do not serve or worship a God who is sitting on his sitting on his throne, looking at us, and is all needy. Do you get that? We don't serve a needy God. We don't worship a needy God. He's not up there going, oh, I'm lonely. Oh, if I just could have a relationship with you. No, God is in perfect relationship within the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he loves us so much. He wants us. He desires us to be a part of his life. Not our life, his life, because he gives us life. And he gives us purpose. And he calls us out of the darkness. He calls us out of whatever situation that we're in. And he just says, hey, hey, get up. Get up and walk. Get up and walk. It's okay if you don't even have the faith to understand it all right now. Baby steps. Baby steps. Baby steps. You're going to see the big picture one day. But right now, baby steps. Just walk. It is okay. For you and for me to not be okay. But 
Jesus does not want us to stay there. We got it? It's okay to need help. It's okay to want help. And God heals us in many different ways. Sometimes it's an instant. And sometimes it's over time. Sometimes he uses modern medicine or psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists or whatever. He uses many different ways. And then sometimes, and we don't understand why, sometimes he heals us by calling us home. But make no mistake about it. God is still a God of miracles, and he's still a God that heals. You know, what baffles me about this is that God, Jesus could have walked into this situation and just cleaned the whole thing out. He could have cleaned the whole pool of Bethesda out and just healed everybody. And we don't know why he didn't, but he was on the way to a big feast, a big celebration... And he entered into a place where people would be like, yeah, I don't really want to go there today. There's a lot of misery there. I don't really want to go there. And Jesus was like, yeah, we're going. We're going. And he walked through that crowd of people. He didn't have overloaded crowd sensation. He walked through that crowd of people to the one. I don't want you to miss that. You may feel like you're lost in the crowd. You may feel like God's forgotten your name. God is not confused. He is not put off. He is not overwhelmed by our situations or our circumstances. He can walk through the messiness, the busyness, the crowdedness of our lives... And speak to the heart of our being. You know, I, 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 I hate to say I got. I got to. Um, I was asked. And I was humbled to be asked. And I don't say I got to as in, woo, it was an exciting thing, like a roller coaster ride. I, re I received an invitation and an opportunity to preach a, a, a friend of mine's funeral that I grew up with. A month or so ago. And um, that was humbling and hard. But, oh man, it was, it, was, it was such a joy just to be able to share John's life with people and his family and friends and us to talk and, and to talk about the hope we have in Jesus. And he got sick and you know, the last parts of his life, he had been a believer, but the last parts of his life, he really leaned in to his faith and his walk with Jesus. And one of the things that I said at the funeral is that, you know, we're good about quoting scripture and some may have it on a wall or, you know, maybe he had a shirt with it sometime, you know. Well, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord from Jeremiah. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope. Plans to give you a future. And that's true. <laughs> but so many times in our lives, we look at scriptures like that and we quote scriptures like that and we're like, where is that in my life, God? Where is that hope? Where is that future? Where is that plan to prosper me? Because I don't see any of that right now. And yet, we forget the context of that scripture. That scripture was written in the middle of intense Babylonian captivity. And God spoke those words to a people that needed to hear that he had not forgotten their name. He spoke those words into a desperate point of their life. To remind them, I've got you. I know it doesn't look rosy now, but there's a purpose for the suffering. 
I got you. I have not forgotten your name. I have not forgotten your address. And if you hold on, you may not see the big picture now, but I've got plans to prosper you, to give you hope, to give you a future. In the midst of your situation and in my situation today, he says the same thing. You may not see the big picture yet, but I got you. I got you. Get up, take up your mat, and walk. The meaning of Bethesda has dual meaning. In the original language, it could be a house of mercy. It can also be translated a place of sorrow or despair. It can also be translated as a place of outpouring. That day it was all. We see all of that. It was a house of despair that got turned in to a place of mercy and an outpouring of life. Same thing with our lives. Our places of despair through Jesus becomes a place of mercy and hope that leads to an outpouring of life. You see, this is the thing about grace, God's grace. Not human's grace, God's grace. God's grace does not leave us where we are. But tells us to get up, take a step and walk, and it sends us and leads us on the way. It's okay. I'm going to say it again. For you to not be okay. It's okay for me to not be okay. But Jesus does not want us to stay there. He's got something more for us. He's got life and it is abundant. John and the band is about to come back up here and lead us. Listen to that rain. It's an outpouring. It is an outpouring. But I don't want you to miss that. Because there's so many, there's been times in my life where this has happened, where I've heard the pouring of rain and God has reminded me just as I'm soaking the very earth and at some point it floods and it overruns. That is my grace and that is my favor and that is my love for your life. And I have washed away all of the mess, all of the brokenness, and life is going to happen because I am life and I'm inside of you to the Holy Spirit. God's grace does not lead, uh, leave us where we are. It tells us to get up and it sends us on our way. It leads us to where he wants us to be. I don't know what you got going on in your life this morning. Let it come. I don't know what you got going on in your life this morning, but all that you hear right now, I want you to think about that as the grace of God just raining down on your life and the love of God just raining down on your life. All He asks you to do is come. Get up. Just get up. It's not an angry get up. Sometimes we think about God as the angry father looking down a pointy nose with, you know, wire rim glasses and, well, you really blew it this time. Get up. Just get up. Nope. That's not him. That's not him. Hey, oh my gosh, I created you. I know you, I know you better than, than you know yourself. You know, I know all the numbers here, hairs on your head or not. You know, I, I, I know everything about you. You are not stuck where you think you're stuck. You are not, you don't have an anchor around your feet. Get up. Just get up. Get up. I, I'm walking with you. Get up. I walked into your situation. I made the decision to divert off of the path to walk into your situation. Get up. Hey, come. Just get up. Get up. Walk. Take that step. I don't know what step you need to take this morning. But I, again, I encourage you to take a deep breath because Jesus loves you right where you are right now in your skin. <laughs> but he's got something so much greater for all of us.
He truly takes graves and turns them into gardens. And we're about to sing about that. Where we see death, he sees life. Where we see sickness, he sees someone that's whole. When he, where we see despair, he sees hope. Where we see a mountain, he sees a way. Just take a step. Let's pray together. God, we just come to you right now. We're not deserving of it. We did not do anything to earn it. We cannot earn it. God, you just give us your love anyway. You knew thousands of years ago that we were going to be sitting in a building just like this and just be cracked open on the inside. Or maybe we were cracked open on the inside and we've been made whole and healed and we're in the position to help others that are in that situation. I mean, God, you knew where we were going to be and God, you were meeting us here right now. And for everybody, the fear, any despair, whatever need is in this place, and maybe the greatest need is salvation of, for the first time for someone just to say, God, I... I know I've messed up. I'm a sinner. And I need your saving grace. And I'm just asking you just to forgive me of my sins. I'm asking you to come into my life and just make me new and make me whole. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. You meet us where we are, Jesus, and you know what we need. We pray for healing now. We pray for provision. We pray for wisdom. We pray for knowledge. We pray for whatever we need, whatever you have for us, whatever we don't even know to ask for. We're just saying, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And it's in your name. Amen.